While television has provided a comfortable home for the middle class for over 50 years, many of its most memorable characters have been working class. Though producers insist that television is meant to entertain and not to educate, blue-collar shows have undeniably played a pivotal role in shaping our perceptions of working-class people. But because we see television as just entertainment, we readily disregard its impact on our thinking. It's precisely because we believe television is merely entertainment that we need to take its image of the working class seriously. turns out that in the United States, uh, about 62% of the labor force are working class people. That is people who go to work, they do their jobs, uh, they go home, they go to another job, but they don't have a lot of control or authority over their work. Well, the, the frustrating thing is that every time you try to bring up the subject of uh, economic injustice and uh, the fact that so many Americans work full time and don't make enough to live on, etc., some conservative is going to say, that's class warfare. You know, can't say that. Uh, we're, all, we're all supposed to get along and ignore that. You know, being working class seems kind of like a lifestyle choice where people, you know, like pink flamingos and tacky uh, furniture in their house and uh, don't have much taste. Just trying to give your family a little culture. Bet if I shoved it in a hot pocket and smothered it in Velveeta, the four of you would be out back wrestling over it. <laughs> is if people choose to have lower incomes when class, in reality, is powerfully structured by social forces. So Jerry Springer, who introduces his show with a television in the trash can, is where all the qualities associated with white trash are on display. And it's interesting because it's a multiracial world. It's a sort of equal opportunity spectacle because the common link here is social class. And behind the scenes, of course, by the producers, these people are referred to as trailer trash. Uh, so they are condescended to behind the scenes, and they are sought out and coached to behave in a particular way. And what images of the working classes do we see there? These people are out of control. They have no discipline. Uh, their sex lives are all over the place. And married with children, it's so over the top. And the fact that these this family, that the Bundys themselves are totally disenfranchised, that they simply do not have access to the American dream. These families give rise to a couple kinds of kids. Either they're smart and talented, which reinforces the myth of meritocracy. These kids are going to make it out regardless of the circumstances. Or the kids are deviant in a number of ways. You know, the Bart Simpson type. Ooh. Let's go break something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the two biggest troublemakers are definitely Beavis and Butthead. And these guys celebrate stupidity and they live for sex and violence. It plays on a generation of youth raised in a media-saturated society of junk culture, commodity, and alienation, where the parents are driven out of the home and into the labor force, and where the TV becomes the babysitter and the role model. There is an element of working class revenge for these two guys that surely come from broken homes and a disintegrating community where school and work in the fast food industry are meaningless and they're downwardly mobile with a bleak future, if any. In good times, all the characters knew that they were being exploited. They were always struggling against the man. No, man, I tell you the way it is. I got a family. They need food on the table and clothes on their back and I got to pay rent. Now, I need that job. Government rules can't be broken. Unless you're running the government. <laughs> but they always had these dreams, that classic American dreams, that if they work hard, that they'll finally get out of the projects and they'll succeed. Hey, but without money, people like us ain't got no chance at all. But it ain't always going to be that way, James. And of course, that doesn't happen to the very end of the program, the, the last episode, which is sort of like Gilligan's Island, where they get off the island and they, they escape the, the projects. There is a certain kind of criminalization of the black body, so that black masculinity is seen as a place of fear. It's a way of trying to 
use race as a substitute to talk about class, since so much of our tradition is about individual mobility and sort of making it through the American dream. Some of what I think cop shows do is to reinforce this universe about not only who is criminal in the kind of collective imagination, but the inevitability and the kind of naturalness of it. The whole conservative political agenda of the last 30, 40 years has been to attack the poor, which is really to attack workers, because most people who are poor are workers. They work for a living, or, but they have low wages, or they have experience of unemployment. So if we talk about the poor as something that's separate from workers, we're making a big mistake. This is not a narrow working class interest. We're losing, we're losing essentially a century of, of, of industrial and um, economic progress, even as we speak. And that, that's, that's a good way to form a class alliance. It means restraining capital. It means restraining the large corporations who are controlling the destiny of the United States to the detriment of the American people. You can't change the portrait of corporate television to make us look more realistic and more complex and more humane without changing the inhumane situation that we live in. And so social movements and social struggles um, around other issues in our society are tied directly to media representations. You know, so it's not enough to fight at the level of media. You've got to do everything at once. And when you do that, when you make new people, you've got to make new television.